500 years is a long time, as men measure time. Yet that is the span of an era that begins here today. The date is Friday, June 8, 1962. The place is Esterhazy, Saskatchewan, Canada. For here, three quarters of a mile down, lies a treasure locked for 300 million years. And it's taken five years to get there. I started working on October 20th, 1962. And my first position was a minor operator underground. There was hardly any room in the potash station. I believe there was about three or four feet between the shuttle car and the, uh, the sinking bucket. That's how close it was. And I think I can remember that like it happened yesterday. My first day at the mine was phenomenal to be in the type of construction and atmosphere that was going on. I mean, that did not exist in rural Saskatchewan. Early days of the mine, well, <laughs> you started off with almost bare hands tight. I think the first thing that we had for transportation was a wheelbarrow that we could put our tools and bits and whatnot into. It was tough in the beginning, let's face it, but it was, it was good after. The early times were probably uh, my fondest moments because you were learning so much and there's a high level of activity. The mine meant everything to the town. There, there is no way. I remember my mother doing the census back in uh, the late 50s. It was a sleepy little community of 749 people. Esther Hazy had ruts that deep in the, in the, in the main street and, uh, you know, wooden sidewalks and stuff like that, you know. The philosophy of the, of, the, of the company at that time was to try and have all the communities in the, in the area uh, benefit from, from, the, from the advent of the mine. So the mine brought in a curling rink, a skating rink, a golf course, uh, all, the, all the facilities the schools. It's a tremendous growth that you see here through the industry. And Esther Hesia became the, uh, the potash capital of the world. <laughs> to a farmer, I think it's probably very important. <laughs> potash is one of the three fertilizers needed to grow crops. Potash becomes an integral part of increasing bushels per acre, increasing production, so we can feed the world. Well, the biggest changes are in technology, no question about it. Uh, the mining, uh, potash mining has gone from two rotor to four rotor operation. The technology has advanced to very sophisticated equipment, which didn't exist back then. Safety has made leaps and bounds in terms of getting front and center, and the people have reacted very well and developed their own skills to meet the needs of the company. What I enjoy most about working at the mine is the dynamic environment, especially my role in research. We get to work underground, we get to work on surface, so we get to experience the whole um, mining from rock right to product. You know, starting K3 and the K2 expansions, uh, this whole, the whole mine has transformed in the last couple of years and just the potash tons that, that we'll be producing in the next, um, you know, five to ten years is going to be astonishing. The next 50 years should look toward um, taking advantage of all the things that come forward, trying to be progressive. It's a good, clean place to work and uh, the people you work with care about each other. So it's something to be proud of and I'm very pleased that the 50th anniversary is being recognized in such a strong way. The future of potash mining is here in Esterhazy. We love it out here, we love the communities, we love our jobs and, and 
the experience and the opportunity to grow as a young professional is amazing. I was proud of, of my company. That was my company, you know, because that was my life. And I was proud of that and that's why I gave it all. It's great to be a part of all this innovation and, and see the company move forward and work towards a nice common goal. I wouldn't work any place else in the world. Our goal is to feed more people. There's, there's millions of people every day that go to, you know, go to bed hungry, and we're going to help that. So it's, it's a noble cause, and so you feel good about doing something good. During the early days, there were a lot of skeptics. Nobody really thought, or very few people thought, that we could take this plant and produce potash. We built the plant. Uh, the view of our competitors changed dramatically. At first, they said, well, it couldn't be done. It had been tried before. We're proud of our operation because we have a unique process. We have the highest quality product in the marketplace, and we have the best people. We have a great potash formation that was found in the Bell Plain vicinity and it was very attractive except for the depth of the formation, which didn't allow conventional mining. The plant was built in the early 1960s by PPG Industries and there was a guy with PPG Industries named Barney Edmonds. He had a vision that you could solution mine potash here in Saskatchewan. He certainly was right. Uh, the plant was built and it's prospered ever since and now it's a very important part of Mosaic's portfolio of plants. The Belle Plaine site is special because it was so unique. It was uh, the first of its kind in solution mining in the world. We've got something unique in terms of our technology. In a nutshell, it's pretty simple. You take warm water, warm brine, you inject it down to the same level as the potash strata, you mine out or dissolve the uh, potassium and sodium uh, chloride salts, you bring them to surface, and you find a way to process them. Back in the 60s, here within this Regina Moustard corridor, uh, potash was new. They didn't have any idea who we were, what we would do. The engineers and the management weren't even sure how, how well it was going to work. Again, at that time, it was basically a, a very uh, secretive process. They were still doing uh, some uh, experimental work um, to try to determine what was the best way to run the, the process. Management really encouraged our input in day-to-day -day operations because it was a learning process, I think, for everybody. The first potash was produced here in August of uh, 1964. I think when we started, we produced about 800,000 tons a year. It was all optimistic, and it was always growing. The plant was always growing. Just seeing the plant expand and grow from you know, almost three times its original size of big achievement for the employees here. I think Bell Plain was uh, considered very forward thinking in their approaches to health and safety and policies, procedures, techniques. We've been very blessed to have innovation here where people can look at the process and say, okay, if we do this, It'll make things much, much better. And we never stop doing that. Every, every minute of every day, you looked at things and said, how, could I make, how can I make it better? How can I make it last longer? How can I make it more reliable? Since that first ton of potash rolled off the belt at Bell Plain in 1964, this is a plant that's been continually improved, continually looked at, and even to this day with our young engineers, we're encouraging them to take nothing for granted. Just because it's been here for 50 years doesn't mean it can't be improved upon or that there isn't a better technology out there that we should be applying. Solution mining is inherently energy intensive. 
the workforce came up with the idea that to cool the brine, instead of expending additional energy to cool it, we'll take advantage of Mother Nature's winter and we will let her cool the brine for us. Pond Technology added over the course of years about a million extra tons of productive capability and was a breakthrough technology for the site. I don't even think of it as a mine as much as a uh, just a, a, a very unique production facility that uses uh, smart technology to make smart products. The biggest thing I noticed out here was the people. That was a very good place to work. Everybody pulled together and everybody was really uh, a good team together. We were, we were a group. We were a family of people trying to get a potash plant running. We really felt that we were, we were doing an important job, both for the community and for the world. Employees at our site have always been passionate about the communities around them and there is a number of organizations that they really rally behind and support. So in Moose Jaw, it's Hunger in Moose Jaw and the Habitat Builds. Being able to put back to the community is, is enriching our employees' families' lives as well as their friends and neighbors. On the front sign it says this is the world's largest solution mine and that says a lot in itself. What's been accomplished here is, is truly remarkable over the years. We had pride in our work, we had pride in, in the potash that we made and I know there was always one question that was asked me is how many years will this place be open? And we were always told well we have at least 300 years of potash here. So it's very unique to work for a company that's going to be here for a long term. Now we're celebrating a 50th and uh, I think this is just a small milestone in terms of uh, where this plant will be. The nice thing about being part of a potash mine is it's, it's there to help grow the crops to feed the world. I'm proud to be part of the last 50 years of operation of Bell Plain and I'm really enthusiastic about what we have going for us going forward. We're going to deliver results on production and we're going to do it safer and more responsible to the environment than we ever have. More than 3,000 feet below this prairie landscape sits one of the best ore deposits in the world. More than 50 years ago, the first production shaft began its descent deep into the earth in Esterhazy, Saskatchewan. On June 8, 1962, they hit potash. Over the years, these deposits became Mosaic's K1 and K2 mines and are now touted as the world's largest potash operations. In 1985, the K2 mine experienced brine inflow. That's when salt water leaks into a mine from the water-bearing layers above the potash seam. Ingenuity and innovation helped Mosaic manage this common underground mining challenge for the past 30 years. Looking to the future in 2009, Mosaic announced the first phase of its planned expansion program that included the first new production shaft in Saskatchewan in over 50 years. With a scope of developing the mine to produce 2.7 million ore tons with expandability. In 2015, Mosaic's board of directors approved a change in scope for the project, agreeing to accelerate the second phase of development. The additional development included an overland conveyor system to transport ore from K3 to the K2 and K1 mills, construction of a production head frame at the south shaft, and complete mine development. By accelerating the second phase, the mine can operate at its full design production capacity for delivering 6.3 million tons of product or 19 million ore tons per year. 
the accelerated construction plan moved up the time frame for a transition from underground mining operations at K1 and K2 to K3. That would eliminate the need for brine management and substantially lower cost per ton of potash. On February 16, 2017, K3 hit potash at 3,350 feet. The K3 mine and the K3 shaft as we hit potash today represents the future of K3 and it really is the vision and the fulfillment of the strategy and vision for the potash business unit here in Saskatchewan. From the get-go, uh, we set a very high bar for safety. Um, tremendously important, uh, the values of Mosaic, uh, that each and every one of our employees go home safely. This is a challenging thing. You're working uh, for four and a half years, sinking a 28-foot diameter hole, 3,400 feet in the ground. Uh, a lot of activity. Uh, focus on safety has to be paramount every day. Uh, and we've executed extremely well on this project. It was great. Today's milestone at Esther Hazy K3 is a seminal event for Mosaic. This represents many decades of operation here in Saskatchewan. We believe that this will be the largest and most efficient potash mine in the world using state-of-the-art technology and to reach the potash zone layer is something that we should all feel very proud of. We have one of the lowest cost mines in the world and so for Mosaic it really represents a step in our strategy to take us to the next generation. Next, progress will move from vertical shaft sinking to horizontal mine development. First, cutting a pass between the two shafts. Much of the required infrastructure will be added to the shafts, including lowering equipment to be reassembled for mine development and future production. The people have had to be so attentive, so dedicated, and just hardworking. It's a tribute to all of our people. Thank you all for coming out to celebrate uh, you know, a real a major milestone on the K3 project. Well, I think this is a continuation of a very successful story that uh, Potash has been in this area. This is a uh, commitment by Mosaic to Esther Asia and the province and the country to continue this success story. The K3 project really represents the next 50 years of Esther Hazy. It represents our final steps in mitigating the brine inflow risk and really setting ourselves up for one of the best potash mines in the world. potash facility is more than a mine. It is an integrated operation with office buildings, storage buildings, milling facilities, a tailings management area, and tall head frames that house the surface and production shafts. And it's driven by people with a diverse mix of training and skills. Geologists, mine workers, engineers, administrators, technicians, and others. All these people contribute to feeding the future. Safety is our top priority, and every employee, supplier, and visitor to a Nutrien Potash operation receives safety training and is required to wear personal protective equipment in all areas of our operation. Let's begin our tour at the service shaft, which connects service operations to the ore body about one kilometer underground. A large industrial elevator, called the cage, carries people, supplies, and even vehicles and mining equipment to underground operations. It travels at roughly 400 meters per minute, moving the length of a football field in about 15 seconds. A trip down the shaft is like a journey through time, with each layer of rock representing hundreds of thousands of years of deposits. When you reach the mine area, the rock around you is nearly 400 million years old and the natural temperature is a constant 27 degrees Celsius or 81 degrees Fahrenheit, even in the middle of a Canadian winter. 
Underground operations have roads, vehicles, offices, electrical stations, and repair shops. Vehicles designed for safety and energy efficiency transport workers from the service shaft to active mining areas, often dozens of kilometers away. Our highly trained team studies the depth, shape, and thickness of a deposit, identifying the safest and most efficient ways to access the ore body. Innovative technologies continue to improve the way we mine and enhance the safety of underground workers. At the rock face, powerful potash boring machines cut wide tunnels to extract ore from the deposit. A typical mine will have a number of borers operating at different locations to be able to produce a continuous supply of ore to feed the processing mill. As the borer advances, a series of conveyors carry the raw ore to underground storage areas until it can be hoisted to the surface for milling. Large bucket containers, called skips, carry the ore to the surface. As one skip is being filled at the bottom of the shaft, a second skip is dumping ore at the top in a continuing cycle that takes about 90 seconds to complete. Once the ore reaches the mill, we begin the process of transforming it into plant-ready fertilizer. Milling can be broken into three main stages, crushing and cleaning, flotation and drying, and sizing and compaction. In crushing and cleaning, raw ore is fed into large crushers to make the pieces a more uniform size. The crushed ore is fed into agitation tanks, or scrubbers, filled with a brine solution. During this process, called desliming, the mix goes through screens, cyclones, and other specialized equipment to remove clay particles, leaving behind potash and salt. In flotation and drying, we separate potash from the salt crystals. During flotation, a reagent is added to the mixture and causes air bubbles to form around the potash crystals. The crystals then rise to the surface and are skimmed from the solution by paddles, moving one step closer to a finished product. To remove excess moisture, the slurry of potash and brine is fed into large centrifuges that pull the brine away from the potash, like the spin cycle of a washing machine. The damp potash is then fed into fire dryers that take out the remaining moisture. To prepare consistently sized granules, we begin the process of sizing and compaction. Potash is sized and separated through a system of oscillating screens, sifting through the different sized crystals. Undersized crystals are pressed together, then crushed and screened again. This compaction process is repeated until the granules have a common size. At this stage, the product can be sent to warehouses, and each nutrient facility has significant storage capacity. From these facilities, plant-ready potash can be loaded into rail cars and shipped to buyers around the world. Almost all the potash we produce in Canada is exported to other countries, where it is applied to improve crop yields and quality. It's how Nutrien fulfills our purpose, to grow our world from the ground up. temporary pump room. These are all flow serve pumps. Each one is rated for about 235 cubic meters per hour. So we've got a total of nine pumps going here. Close to 2300 cubic meters of pumping capacity in this area alone. Okay. Now uh, just go through a few key points. Uh, the underground water management is to ensure the continuous safe operation of the mine in case of the largest estimated inflow. That's very key that we do have that capacity plus spare capacity. And that works out to about 2,500 cubic meters of uh, pumping capacity. That includes that spare capacity, almost twice the capacity required to, to deal with an inflow.
The ROM area is part of the process area. From the jet boring machine that you saw this morning, the cuttings goes to the uh, ROM area, run of mine. So we have the south and the north. And basically they are uh, storage areas for the cuttings from the, uh, from the jet boring that's recovered by, by the clamshell and put into the crusher, which goes to the ball mill. And then from the ball mill, goes to the clarifier, which adjusts the density for pumping or going to the ore slurry hoisting system on the 500 level, which will pump it directly to surface to the slurry loadout. Okay, any questions on that? So we'll just proceed up in here. I want to give you an idea what the, the interior of the ROM area will look like. The cuttings will go either in this ROM or at the other end behind another uh, concrete uh, uh, bulkhead. Clarifier adjusts the density of a, uh, a slurry. Okay, so what we're doing right now is we've gone, done the additional ground support, cable bolt, screening, shock rating, and we're putting the monorail in right now. Once that's done, we'll muck out the next level, do the ground support, and then take out the final cut because there's actually a little bit of a ramp going down here and clean that up, and then we're ready for construction in this area. This is where number two shaft will break through. First off, let's look at the, uh, the freeze system that we have in here. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with freezing, uh, we bring the brine down at approximately minus 38 degrees Celsius. And we, it goes through the manifolds here from the heat exchanger. Uh, the pressure in the manifolds is about uh, 100 PSI. That's key when we talk about the, uh, the heat exchanger when we get there. Again, it's for safety reasons that you have it about a, uh, 100 PSI. Now, you have uh, along the back 23 holes, if you count them going around and you see, they're all like that there. And that freezes the perimeter around number two shaft all the way up to where we started sinking again at approximately 390 meters below surface. So you've got a line going in and a line going out. Uh, the line going out then goes to the next hole, so you always got two holes in series, and then goes back into the return line to go back to the heat exchanger. Now this was really quite effective. We were seeing uh, freezing in the area uh, within about uh, three to four weeks, and I believe it was about six weeks uh, until we were able to start uh, shaft sinking. So now key to the shaft sinking is, is the tubbing. And I'm sure most of you are aware of, of the, the tubbing that's used in the potash mines uh, where they go through the Blairmore formation and that protects them from potential inflow. We assessed the, uh, what different options we had for securing the area, hydrocyte uh, liners versus uh, tubbing. And we came up with the assurance of success was tubbing. So we are, we're doing tubbing all the way down to just above the, uh, the 480 level. And that's a long-term solution to any potential inflow from the, uh, from the number two shaft area. We have the heat exchangers here. So we have a low pressure system on the level, approximately 100 PSI. And then we have the high pressure system that goes into the shaft and up to the freeze plant. Uh, the efficiencies are very good. We, it comes down at about uh, minus 38 degrees and uh, uh, it only loses one or two degrees in, in the heat transfer. And the, the uh, brine going out to the uh, areas uh, goes out about minus 37, coming back around minus 34, minus 35 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, of interest, all this has been done since we uh, dewatered. We had to take all those heat exchanges to surface and have them refurbished in Saskatoon and then brought back underground.
this is one of the uh, six bulkheads for the 465 level. It's approximately eight meters deep, tight filled right to the back with concrete. And then the holes that you see, the pipes that you see in here, were used to, uh, to grout it and seal off the, uh, the perimeter of the, uh, around the, uh, uh, the bulkhead. So this is a hydrostatic bulkhead that we have in place. We have six of them to deal with the 465 level. Okay, this is 737 Crosscut North. This is our first uh, freehold uh, uh, drift, and done by the uh, tunnel boring machine. Uh, this we've refurbished the whole area now, and if you look down there, you can see the uh, the feed and the return line for the freeze uh, freezing, and then you can make out the uh, the rubber pipes insulated pipes that are going up to the, uh, the bore holes going into the back, or freeze holes in the back. Very similar to what you saw underneath the uh, number two shaft area. And this concludes your, uh, your tour. We're back at the shop. Very proud of the, uh, the achievements that we have done over the last uh, several years since the inflow. And uh, we're really focused on getting the, uh, the project done on time and safely. The <laughs> Net other Mario Kinot Sanana Conitia was on. Where you took a nut on an indicated certain
I was the first employee at the Cigar Lake Mining Corporation. I joined on uh, May 6th in 1987 and flew into the mine sites six days later. It was a beautiful, clear day. You look down, you could see all the trees, small lakes and creeks joining the lakes together. Then as we're coming in, we could see Waterbury Lake. All there was was this little gravel runway that was there. From there, we had drove into the mine site on a dirt trail, and that was where I saw the exploration camp for the first time, which consisted of three buildings that you had log siding on, and a generator building, and another little building. And then I saw the tents, and that's when, oh, okay, I guess I, I, th I didn't realize I was sleeping in a tent at that time. <laughs> When I arrived, all the data was put out in front of me showing this ore body to be extremely challenging. Some of that clay is so sticky, uh, you take a handful of it and it, it, like snowball and throw it against the wall, it just sticks. And the next chunk that you look at is really hard and abrasive and how easy is this going to be to mine? And then you have running sand. The cores show you every kind of ground in a very small area. So good luck to all of us sort of thing. At Cigar Lake, we've just been one great big science experiment all the time. We're always learning, we're always working with new technologies. You don't get to open a book and say, how do you bulk freeze an ore body? You don't get to open a book and say, oh, look, we'll just, a JBS machine, jet boring system, let's just buy one off the shelf. It had to be custom designed. Just about everything at Cigar Lake is custom designed. There I am, 2008, 2 a.m. local time, standing, just got off a 24-hour plane trip, flying from Saskatoon to Almaty, Kazakhstan, standing, waiting for my bag to come through, and my cell phone rings. Uh, goodness, who, who's phoning me at 2 a.m. in Kazakhstan? I answer the phone, and there's it's Bob, it's Tim, and I gotta tell you that the, the mine, we've had to stop pumping the, the mine is flooding. And I'm, no, 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 Tim. We're lowering the level of the mine. We're pumping it down. It's sealed, we're, we're taking it down slowly. And say, no, no, Bob, the water has started coming in. It was coming in faster than the pump and had to make a decision to uh, let the mine fill again. The innovation of the team is beyond description. It was first the innovation is that how do you find a leak? How the heck? Do you find a leak? And the thoughts of getting submarines that service oil wells and lowering them down a shaft, I mean, that's not something that you normally think of doing. And then the real innovation got started after we'd found the leak. Now, how on earth do you solve that? And it sounds relatively simple. Put a bag, we discovered this inflatable bag, but how the heck do you get it there? All the innovation, and it was the guys, it was the team at site who invented all these catches and quick releases. The whole ability to do that was just, just stood back and just in awe 
of what these guys put together and did. They said it couldn't be done. Well, you know, Cigar Lake's a project I've been working on for pretty well my whole career, over 20 years. To see last March the first truck roll out of the loadout bay loaded with uranium from Cigar Lake was just uh, a really proud moment, uh, probably uh, one of the best of my career. And so really delighted uh, with what's gone on there, proud of the people and the work they've done. And of course, uh, we needed to send that ore somewhere. And so uh, working with our colleagues and friends at Arriva to send that ore to the McLean Lake Mill uh, is going to work out really well. So just really delighted to be part of the whole project. The plant was, uh, was designed with the foresight of being able to produce high-grade ores in the future. We've operated uh, 11 years of lower-grade material and we're excited to, uh, to now be able to put the plant to, to test of the, of the high-grade ores. It's a unique plant in the world in that it can process both low-grade and high-grade ores. It's been a challenge getting to this point over the years and certainly the support and ongoing encouragement of our joint venture partners has been welcome and never in question throughout the process. We've had a lot of help from all kinds of companies helping with the construction, engineering and, and support needed to bring a, a project of this magnitude forward. And lastly, our employees, dedication, professionalism and commitment has really been what's brought this project together. Last uh, month or two, we've been into the high grade finally, and that was the big question mark all these years. Could we mine the cavities in high grade large enough, fast enough to make it a commercial method? And we have. Hi, I'm Les Yesnick, General Manager at Site. Welcome to Cigar Lake. Come with me, let's head underground in the skip at Shaft 1. We're traveling 480 meters beneath the Earth's surface into one of the most unique mines in the world, the second largest high-grade uranium deposit. Innovative technology was designed specifically for this challenging deposit. And as you've heard, what started with a handful of staff has now grown to 700 people. And we take great pride in knowing half of our employees and long-term contractors are from northern Saskatchewan. Here we are, a half a kilometer underground in the mine. Come with me and we'll show you around.
Underground today, we've got around 50 personnel. We have our maintenance group, and they, uh, they work to keep our equipment in top shape. We have our mining crews that are, uh, of course, active, active mining operations. We have long-term contractors doing development work as well. So it's a very busy place underground. This is the jet bore system. The mining method is most easily described as laparoscopic surgery on an ore body. The technology originated here at Cigar Lake, and it allows us to do the work that we need to do. This year alone, we plan on extracting six to eight million pounds of uranium. Our operating license takes us to 2021, and we're looking forward to many bright and busy years ahead. Thanks so much for taking the time to stop by and enjoy the rest of the evening. Okay, <laughs> Harold Siegel Cole, I was, I've lived in Coronac here since 1943. Uh, I was born in Weyburn, Saskatchewan. I was born in March 1927. I grew up at Constance and then here. I've been in this, I've been in the area all my life. My name is Cecil Keast. I was born in this area. Coronac wasn't here then, but it was this area, it was a municipality, and uh, I was born 19th of November, 1921. Other than a five or six year hitch in the army during the war, other than that, I have been in this area all of my life. Oh, 
I don't know of anybody else that's still living that uh, worked in the underground mines around here, and there was a number of mines, but as far as I know, they're all passed on. There was a mine here right in, in Cornac, right in town, that, that they didn't mine under the town, but they mined out from the town. And uh, I worked for a year for Joe Brandeis, and he had the mine. Well, he wanted to sell the mine because he bought the hotel, and uh, so I bought it, and I operated the mine for 1946 and 47. And... Uh, that's when I worked underground there. I worked underground in the mines in BC, but uh, that's my mining experience here is in the, in the mine here in Cornac. Coal has been a necessity. There's no trees in this area when the, the homesteaders came in. And uh, so what are you going to burn for heat? Oil wasn't common in those days, but there was coal. It seems like under nearly every hill, all you had to do was dig in a ways and you would, you would get some coal. There was quite a few mines developed along the muddy up here and, and uh, some east of town. There was some strip mines west of town. My name is Cheryl Jaroje. I was born in 1956, about 15 miles uh, east of Cornac. We uh, had a small farm um, beside a butte, and on that butte, our dad had a coal mine. Well, you're at the uh, entrance to the old Benny Bird coal mine. He. Uh, he had this mine in the 40s, and I guess maybe the early 50s would be the last uh, that it was mined. You can see uh, that depression in the hill up there. That would be the entrance into the mine. And then the, the track would came out to where this post is in the ground here. I remember seeing the entrance to the mine. We would go up there and we uh, the tracks were still there. We could look into it. Dad wouldn't let us into the mine unless we'd get into the car to go down and he'd show us some things, all the little rooms and that. And we'd come up kind of dirty riding in that coal car. My sister and I, we would walk those hills and around the curve from that mine also was another mine that our uncle had previous to that. And from what I know, those two mines intercepted and on the top of the hill was an air shaft. And when we were growing up, that air shaft was still open. So we were specifically told to stay away from that air shaft. And inside the coal mine, the, the, the feeling was different. It was an eerie feeling. Uh, it, you, you're dripping and cracking. I don't know that we were afraid of it, but um, we were just told not to play around there. There had been a collapse in the mine and uh, uh, the cutter, all of dad's things were, are probably still in the mine. Uh, the mine had collapsed and he just walked away from it. Some people can't go underground, but uh, I never had a problem working underground. We were often afraid for for my dad because he could could have got covered up. We were very poor. Um, to me, there was no signs that coal ever really was a very lucrative business for my dad. Dad was a coal miner at. We were happy that he had a job, I think, and he made a good living for us, as good as everybody else. Everybody was poor at that time. I know when I was growing up in the 30s, the mines were all operating, and I, my dad would bring home a load of coal, and we'd put in maybe anywhere from 12 to 20 tons in the cellar to do this for the winter. 
because they did burn a lot of coal. The houses were not insulated like they are today, and the windows weren't as good, and so it took a lot of heat and a lot of coal, a lot of ashes. <laughs> smell was something else. I can always remember the smell of coal. You could taste it in your mouth, even. Bring home just whatever you can handle. And that's kind of the size that will flow through the bottoms of the trucks and stuff when they bring it out of the mine. I, I use this old cook stove that was my mother's in here when I when I can to help keep the heat from being too heat, heat bill from being too high. And uh, we burn wood in it. And uh, as you know, there's not a lot of trees here, so we use coal when we can. And it's available at the mine here, so we, we still burn some coal. I had a coal stove in the corner of the kitchen so in the winter time when it got really really cold dad would still fire up this stove for additional heat in our home i think power came in 1955 the year i was born so i don't remember it in common use but it was in the basement and when the power went out we used it we cooked on a cook stove that had about four round circles of lids and they had a lifter that fit into the lid and a hole in the lid and there was a warming oven at the end of the stove where it kept our water hot. So to get coal burning you can't just put it in and light it up. You have to start your your fire with with wood and I, I started with a wood fire here and then when I add my coal it'll take off. There was pipes all across the, the the room and sometimes when the fire, when we banked it at night, then we bank it with more coal and shut it down and uh, it would keep pretty well warm all night. But sometimes if the wind came up, the uh, air would pull the fire alive and uh, you'd look up and see the chimneys or the stovepipes starting to redden. I wonder the houses didn't burn down then. Well, all the mines in this area closed down in the late 40s and uh, around 1950, 51. There was, a, there was a spell from the 1950s to the 1970s where there was no demand for coal. From 1970s until now, coal has been a, important. I was talking in the middle 70s and I was already farming um, and I, we knew there was something coming. There was a lot of seismic activity so it was going to be either oil or something they were looking for and we eventually found out there would be a coal project and a, and a power plant. I grew up on the farm here and it would be a third generation farm when I started growing up on it and uh, loved the cattle and the land and the crops and uh, just country boys. We explored all the the country knew every nook and cranny of the land. We would either ridden horses on it or rode dirt bikes on it. Originally, SAS Power ran the mine and the power plant, so this would have been all up to them. And so we, I remember going to these public meetings and uh, looking at the big map on the wall and realizing our farm is in that mine project. Well, it was kind of a shock because you don't think about changing your location or moving your location if your farm it's always been a long long term thing i think everybody was apprehensive because uh the first thing you know is that when there's going to be a strip mine project it's it's either going to be we're going to live on the land or they're going to mine the land so we can't both be here and i think everybody realized that if there's a, a large strip mining project it's going to displace a lot of farmers the surface rights organization was set up as a result of the government attempting to buy a considerable amount of farmland in this area and uh, buying it from the individuals. They were much in a much better position to deal if they were a group rather than individuals. This appears to have been very, very successful. Um, their corporation was set up over 40 years ago, is still operating uh, and still serving the same purpose.
when this uh, this project was announced first, uh, our local people here in, in this area thought they would go down to Estevan and have a look, see what happened down there, because they knew that Estevan had been involved with the, with the very sort of thing that we were running into. They find there's dirt piles 20 or 30 feet high being left on the land, which really makes it of no value at all for farming. And so that was one of their main concerns of they didn't want to see that happen here. It would wipe out the area, actually. Lots of, lots of stress, lots of sleepless nights. And as we've been 20, 30, 40 years down the road, we see people who've gone through it. They've gone on with life. They're okay. But those first guys didn't know what was going to happen to them. And I think probably we saw people suffered. The amount of money being offered to these farmers in the first place was the kind of of money that would be would have been paid if you sold your farm to the neighbor, but when it's being sold for commercial production, like for the production of coal for the power plant, uh, that's quite different. So we realized it had to happen, and we approached it as uh, this is going to happen, and it's an essential thing, and it's good for jobs in the community, and it's good for. Uh, People need the power. So we, we saw it with some sort of uh, adventure as well. Len and I were married in 1973, and um, he was a uh, heavy-duty mechanic. Uh, he had worked in Regina and Weyburn, and we got married, and we um, thought we would start out our married life here in Cornac, but we weren't doing very well. We were looking at Medicine Hat, we were thinking of making moves. Um, and then the there was the big announcement that um, a coal mine was coming to Cornac, a power plant, and uh, in 1979, Glenn joint, went to work at the mine. So that was a huge, huge, um, happening in our lives um, and what it has meant is our is um, well what it meant was making a living and which has been making a living for us for well Glenn's been at the mine 38 years this year. I came here in uh, 1978 and started working at the at the coal mine, I, I, I worked construction, building the power plant and the original mine, which was west of town. And uh, in 1985, uh, I ended up being employed by the coal company here and worked for them for the remaining 28 years of my career. I think the mine and the plant really put some life back into this area. Coal uh, carried the farmers and the settlers here for a number of years, but then when, uh, in the 70s, when the power plant was built here, and it was built here because it was coal here, uh, and the mine opened, um, it transformed Cornac from a small village in the middle of nowhere to uh, a fairly substantial community. It was exciting. The town was uh, maybe 350 people when this was announced. So we were here for all the excitement, the construction, the, um, the it was exciting to see the housing starts in town. The sports flex came, the swimming pool, um, a few businesses sprung up. Without coal, we would not be where we are today. Our kids were able to go to school here. I doubt that with this, if this project had not happened, I don't know if, if um, how much longer Cornac, or maybe even a lot of small towns around here, would have survived. We've recognized in this community the power plant and the mine employ probably 300 families, 300 people. 
and it's kept the school, it's kept the rink, and it's kept stores. And uh, so the industry has been good for the community, the jobs. Um, we're all glad to turn on our thermostat and plug in our vehicles and use the power. And we've worked out equitable ways to deal with the, with the disruption that it causes with farming and, and we're all here. We're just about 50 miles north of Cornac. We're down in the pit at the coal mine, one of the two pits, where the loaders lo actually loaded coal to get shipped to the power plant. We mine 3.5 million tons a year we sell to Sauce Power. And it's a lignite coal, and it's a strip mine that's not underground like it was in the past. We mine with drag lines and strips, and the drag lines actually don't touch the coal, they just take the overburden off the coal and trucks and shovels and loaders take the coal out of the pits. Montgomery. I'm from Willowbunch. We're at Sass Power, Poplar River today. Um, I've been here for 11 years and I'm a coal handler. I'm Scott Kirby, uh, born in Cornac. We farm just outside of town. Uh, I've been here since 98 and I'm a coal handler too. We're a, a coal-fired uh, power station. We produce um, on, at any given time about 630 megawatts of power. Uh, we have two, two coal-fired units, uh, each 315 uh, megawatts. And basically at any given time, we're producing about anywhere from 19 to 20 percent of power being consumed in the province. At Cornac here for the last, well, it's nearly, probably over 10 years now, we've had at the ECRF building or the Emissions Control Research Facility, uh, where we test for uh, we do stuff like mercury recovery and, and just sampling on the on the fly ash and the, and the particulate. I find the work here in the, in the research facility extremely interesting because it's new, it's cutting edge. So I started here in 2004 and our first, uh, the first phase of the test facility was for uh, studying uh, the ability to detect and remove mercury from the flue gas that, uh, that uh, most lignite coal power plants all have mercury emissions. So SAS Power, with some recently imposed restrictions on on uh, uh, emissions, uh, decided to put the test facility in place uh, to test to see if we could control or reduce our mercury emissions. As uh, attracting employees and, and retaining them, we, we've 
you know, we found our best, uh, the best way to do that is to hire local people because they want to stay, they're used to a small town. Um, and they, you know, it's, it works out good for us because they, they're from this area, so they, you know, they want the place to do well. They take a lot of ownership and, and pride in, in working at, at, at Poplar River. Lots of friends actually out of high school started in this plant that have moved on to the line crew or Esteban or Saskatoon. But for me, I guess I'm still in Cornac because of, of the ranch. Like, um, if, it, if I wasn't tied down to the, our ranch and that's what my passion is, I guess, I probably wouldn't be in Cornac either. But um, this plant and the mine have have held a lot of people, not held, but kept a lot of people in this area, not just Cornac, but you got Willowbunch, Bengoff, Assiniboia, Rockland, and a lot are tied directly or indirectly to the mine and the plant. Most of us that started in, I'm going to say around the time I started, the early 80s, it, farming, we, most of us all farmed, and some still do, but farming really wasn't good, so we thought, well, we'll just start at the mine. We all, everybody wants to run equipment, and it's just become a lifelong, it was a dream and a lifelong experience that most of us, most all of us have just thoroughly enjoyed. It's been great. Uh, my name is Parker Beauchene. I'm a loader operator here at Hopper uh, River Mine. I run the Cat 993 that's sitting behind me here. Been here for four years now. Uh, from Willowbunch, uh, I got a family farm there. It's been in the family for over 100 years. So the, with the 12-hour days and the shift work, it gives me lots of opportunity to, to help out there. Been at the mine here for 31 years now, and I'm proud of the fact that I've been at one job that long. It's it's a great job. It's uh, great guys to work with. It's great for the for the local economy, like. Uh, Cornac itself has uh, 700 people live in the town. Between the mine and the power plant, that's all coal industry. We have, well, sure, we have our agriculture as well, but the town wouldn't be the size it is if it didn't have coal. I've been at the mine for going on 33 years. I've uh, been a drag mine operator for about 20 or so. And uh, my family farm was bought up by this like, by the mining company. And uh, yeah, I mean, They've been a great industry for our community. I'm Bryce Rolson. I'm from Cornac, Saskatchewan. Been here all my life. Uh, working the dragline as a dragline boiler. Where I grew up, uh, we basically the the mine took the block of land where we uh, where I grew up, and uh, it's all mine now. But it's slowly being reclaimed. I notice, and uh, I guess it's progress, right? <laughs> You can see we've got two D10 dozers that are reclaiming this land back to a farmable state. They'll take it down to a 10% slope, so it's, uh, and then we'll re-cover re, uh, soil it after. So the first step in the, in the coal mining process is removing the cover soil. Uh, we call it cover soil, it's really just the top 20 centimeters of topsoil. Um, anything that's really great for growing in is what we save. So before we do any other things uh, on the mine site, we make sure to save that the very valuable topsoil. Um, we put it either in stockpiles or we direct place it on other areas of the mine site. Um, but that's the very first step. Um, then once the, the drag lines expose the coal and the coal is mined out, then we get to the next process in, in the reclamation. So what you're really doing is you're, you're taking the, the material that was once on top of the coal and you're pushing it back into the hole. The topsoil is actually placed out in a nice even thickness, which is sometimes better than the way Mother Nature puts it on there. Um, so it gives us a really nice, great uh, growing material medium, so that we're able to revegetate it. A lot of areas that we've we've mined through, there was a lot of hilly areas, and, and of course back then it was half and half farming. So there was an awful lot of erosion, and and we stripped the cover soil off prior to stripping with the drag lines, and on the hilltops there's basically maybe an inch of that. In the bottoms you could get up to four feet. So we mine through and level all the land out and lay the cover soil all back on and it's eight inches even everywhere where we've mined. So it's laid on and it's monitored really closely. We're, we're very proud of our reclamation. I don't think there's anybody does as good a job. I'd like to see it if they do. 
I love the drag life. I mean, it's just like a home. I've been here quite a few years, and I kind of know the old girl a little bit. And, uh, uh, yeah, and I mean, the people are good to work with. Uh, you know, I've got a good oiler to work with, and the guys are good. So it makes my job easier when the guys, you know, all do their job, and like, we all work together as a team. The environment is is really great to work in. Um, everybody's always very friendly and very helpful and um, it's just a, I was just drawn to it immediately so that's kind of why I was very happy that this position opened up when I graduated. I just think it's a really good place to work. The fellowship with the men, watching young people come up now through the through the ranks, learning equipment and different job techniques which we did 30 some years ago. It's just, it's rather interesting and hopefully we can pass on to them things we did to, so they don't have to relive some of the mistakes we made, but just make them better at what they do. I grew up in, uh, on a ranch just uh, northeast of Big Beaver, so I'm a, a local local guy here. I, I guess when I left high school, uh, a friend of mine that was working here gave me a tour of the plant. Uh, at the time, late 80s, early 90s, agriculture wasn't doing so well, so I went to uh, Medicine Hat College and uh, took some power engineering classes and then come back to back to work here at Papa River. I didn't really know much about it even though I grew up in the community. So I applied and got on and I started in utility crew and moved into coal handling and it's been a good fit for me for, uh, for farming. Born and raised on a farm and uh, actually just uh, Came to uh, this is my 31st year with SAS Power, and I just uh, I had nothing to do with coal before the day I walked in the power plant, my first day of work. Nothing at all. My relatives had. It, um, I'm local. I'm from the area, and there's lots of coal mines in the area. I had I had a lot of I had a few uncles, three or four, that actually worked in some of the old coal mines in this area, mainly around Willowbunch. And my dad worked out here for a good 25 years uh, as a contractor for SAS Power, so. I got ties here too. So. What we enjoy about working out at the plant here and producing power is, you know, that it is a, it's an important job. Uh, people, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, they, they just take electricity for granted. Uh, they don't see a lot of the stuff behind the scenes where, you know, there's guys working out here 18, 20 hours in the middle of the night, you know, trying to get uh, the unit back on and produce power so you know we always try to keep that focus you know we know that you know somewhere somebody is you know relying on us to, to keep the lights on. It's the burning question on, on everybody's mind uh, unfortunately we don't you know we don't know exactly what's going to happen but you know, if you take as you, you know, if you take 150 jobs out of you know, Cornac that work at SAS Power, and you know, I typically about another 150 or so from the mine. You know, it's not only Cornac; it would be a, be a huge impact on all the surrounding areas as well. Coal has supported the community in in one way or another since the homestead days, except for a little gap in in between the 50s and the 70s. I think it would have been a complete disaster, or it would be even now if this project was shut down. Coal is no longer utilized, will be uh, as, have such as big an impact as what finding coal here and, and utilizing it has been over the last number of years. So. Uh, yeah, uh, Karnak is a cold thing, no matter what way you look at it. The town wouldn't be the size it is if it didn't have coal. And uh, the things I've done through the years, like like become involved in the community, uh, I've most recently uh, been elected to town council, but through minor hockey, through refing hockey, through coaching my kids in hockey, baseball, you know, uh, it's a great community to grow up in. If it ever were to go by the wayside, like if, if we were to lose our coal industry, I don't know what would happen to the town. I really don't. You know, it's tough to think about. 
I think there's lots of families in Cornac just like myself who, if the mine and the power plant weren't here, um, we would have to relocate to find other sources of, of income. Comfortable lifestyles that we all live now in Cornac uh, go back to the source of coal in the community and it will be sad when that is no longer there. Uh, unfortunately, places like Cornac uh, don't have a lot to offer as alternative industry and jobs, and so uh, we will inevit inevitably revert back to the small villages that it once was. And with the agricultural community shrinking in, in actual numbers uh, of people involved, with the larger farms and the modern equipment, uh, Cornac may well go back to being a community of a hundred people, uh, as opposed to what we have today and what we were at our peak. So, yeah, there there will be a huge impact, and uh, I'm not sure that everybody uh, has totally allowed that to sink in and and taken the realization of where will I be 15, 20 years from now. Pretty tough lot. Um, it would be really, really bad if coal wasn't in Cornac, but we always seem to survive. It just, there wouldn't be a lot of a community, but what would be here would be a bunch of tough people that stuck it out. This project coming in here uh, made the big difference in whether this place remained or disappeared. Um, generally speaking, the small towns all around on this line have disappeared completely. Coal has been all about making a living. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. It was uh, making a living for my dad. Um, uh, and it's been how we have made our life. Yeah, all of it has revolved around my husband working at a coal mine. They say they're going to be coal free by 2030. And uh, I don't know, it seems to me that there has to be some way to take the sulfur out of the coal and keep it from going up the stack and heat and sulfur makes sulfur dioxide and sulfur dioxide and water makes sulfuric acid and this is this is not liked but uh, they're blaming their coal mine for all the climate change and everything else that they talk about but i don't know I've traveled along around quite a bit and I see see the automobiles and I goes to city you know you can go to New York and Houston Los Angeles millions of cars and they're uh, they're spouting off tons uh, ton upon ton more than what this mine is putting out so I, I would like to see more research done to clean up coal because coal is still the cheapest and the most stable source of electrical power that there is. And nobody seems to want to do anything about it except call coal black and get rid of it. Parents had always said, don't go in the mines. There's methane gas or coal gas, I guess they used to call it, in there and it can kill you. So we we knew that. And for the most part, we stayed out of them. I had ventured in to the one that my uncles had run. And I went in a ways just to see what it was like, but never got past the oxygen supply. But sometimes people went further than they should. And I can remember a time when two teenage boys from this community went exploring in the mine that my uncles used to run. 
And um, eventually one guy passed out and his buddy came tearing to our farm. I remember the day he came and he said to my mom, where's Merle? There's a man dying in the mine. And he got my dad off a tractor and took him there. And I think they just had a little flashlight of some kind. And dad went in and he said he had to try and remember where did the tunnels go and which way did the shafts run. And from his best of memory, he said he'd been closed for 20, 20 some years. And he went in and found the, the, the fellow that was passed out, still passed out, but he said the ceiling had fell down in, in a place and there was a hump of dirt where the dirt had landed and it was probably five feet high. So when he fell on that elevated hump, there was still oxygen in the lower, in the higher part of the shaft and it saved his life. And so dad carried him out. He said he was a big boy and he, he said he, his lungs hurt for a week after getting that guy out of there, but it saved their lives. And, and we all learned a lesson. You don't win there. The community then said they need to stick some dynamite in there and bring that mine down so that nobody will do it again. My dad actually works at the coal mine over in Estevan and I was able to work as a summer student down at the mine sites. And I just remember, you know, during the summer times, uh, I was able to, to kind of get my first taste of the coal mine. So while, while my friends were working jobs at the malls and in restaurants, I was down in these big open pits and you could look up and you could see the, the, the earth pretty much exposed. You could see the coal seams and you could see all the different layers and you could just, it was just so different. Um, the equipment that's used here on site is huge. You have to have the, a level of respect too for the equipment that you're around. Yeah, South Block Mine just east of Cornac. It's out where Gus Brandeis is used to mine, I believe. There was a Mickey's mine there too. But when the drag line uncovered the coal and the dozers would go down and clean it, you could see the mine shafts because the dozer tracks would actually break in to the coal. You could just see them indented. So then I was running loader at the time and we'd go down and take the seam out and under the high wall where none of the equipment had touched, the mine shafts were right there. We don't go in them anymore, we can't because of safety and that's a good thing, but we used to go in and take a look and there was pottery, the rail tracks were there, the vents in the roof were there, there was actually engine blocks in the mines. I, I just wish then you were there with your camera and a light, we could have got some real interesting footage. <laughs> I guess... One of my favorite parts of, of the mining was Friday night when we're when we're off till Monday morning. Except some nights we'd renege on doing our shooting Friday night and leave it till Saturday morning, but at least we didn't have to work Friday night. <laughs> Usually there was a dance in some place on Friday night, so we'd Oh, a lot of times we didn't do our Friday shooting on Friday night. We did it Saturday morning. 